Good evening, folks. Welcome aboard Southwest yeah, Airlines good. Flight 372, service to Oklahoma City. Those of you that have flown us before know that we do things a little bit differently here on Southwest. Some of us tell jokes, some of us sing, some of us just stand there and look beautiful. I, unfortunately, can do none of those. So here's the one thing that I do know how to do. We're going to shake things up a little bit. I need a little audience participation. Otherwise, this is not going to go over well at all. This is Flight 372 on SWA. The flight attendant's on board serving you today. Teresa in the middle, David in the back. My name is David, and I'm here to tell you that. Shortly after takeoff, first things first, there's soft drinks and coffee to quench your thirst. But if you want another kind of drink, then just... They said, you can have this space and transform it into the university. Ten classrooms, all this wonderful space. But I designed it with the thought that it, was, it looked like it was still under construction because the thought was mines are always under construction. And we had murals on the wall. There was one mural that had tombstones. <laughs> and they had all the dead airlines on the tombstones, you know, <laughs> Eastern and Pan Am and all the famous airlines that we all know about. Because at some point, something happened, and they are no longer in existence. And then I had one tombstone, and it had to be determined. And that was to remind us constantly that it could be us as well. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Rita Bailey. Uh, you were the head of the recruitment and the university for people. Yes. That's what you call it. Yes. And you interviewed and you trained thousands of people, literally. Right. So, uh, what did you hire and what did you train for these ah. people? Huh? It's interesting because having worked in both areas, both in the hiring and in the training area, people would call oftentimes when I was at the university and they'd say, well, how do you train those flight attendants to sing their announcements and be so happy? Is there a training course for that? And I would say, no, you have to hire for that. We hired for attitude and we trained for skills. You can train somebody how to do something, but you can't train them to have a great attitude. And so we took great pains to do that. Last year, and this was pretty consistent over the years, but last year I pulled up the latest figures and they had 199,000 resumes and applications for 3,300 positions filled. So, and that was pretty normal. And so my goal was to, as Anna said, to liberate people to liberate people so that they could be themselves at work, because why should they be different at work than they are when they go home? But if I were to come to your organizations and ask people who work there, what business are they in, they would probably tell me what they do, or they would tell me what your service is, or they would tell me what the product is. But they wouldn't say what we're about. Like, we consider ourselves a customer service organization that happened to be an airline. We consider ourselves a freedom organization. We gave people freedom that couldn't afford to fly before and people who couldn't afford to go often, we gave them the freedom to do that. So our bigger cause was freedom. Our bigger cause was you know, <coughs> providing that type of ser being a customer service driven organization. Our paychecks were actually signed from your customer <laughs> to remind us constantly that the only reason we existed and we were in business was to serve. You see things uh, listed at Southwest Values like profitability and, and customer service and the kinds of things that are probably on everyone's values list. But things that you may not see on a corporate list are family, egalitarian, altruism, fun, family. Those are things that we lived every day. So if you walked into any of the facilities, you would see people respecting each other. You would see people um, having fun. You would see people communicating openly. You wouldn't see titles on doors. You wouldn't see uh, special parking spaces. You wouldn't see people dressed a certain way. You wouldn't know who the leaders were, the senior leaders versus the frontline employees. We manage in good times for the bad times. So we didn't sit back and get comfortable and rest on our laurels when things were good. And there were many times where Southwest was number one, we were making money, Life was great, but we didn't relish in that. We would spend our time thinking about not if, but when these other things would happen, are we going to be prepared with possible disasters? And so we always had to be prepared for emergency situations like a crash. 
and we've learned from experiences that other airlines had. But I don't think anybody was quite ready for 9-11 uh, and the impact of that because there were so many unknowns. Mm -hmm. And so not knowing how long we were going to be grounded, because I think the airlines were grounded for four days, um, and it was a minute by minute, you know, changing situation. So the first thing we did is we activated our command center, and that was our emergency center. And it primarily was for the purpose of communicating, because in a crisis situation, the most important thing that you can do, as you well know, is communicate with people because there's so many uncertainties and people will make up stuff and there's panic and all kinds of chaos happens if people don't have information. Thing. The second thing was the certainty that they were not going to be furloughed. Uh, many of the other airlines started immediately laying people off. Uh, I think part by of the it, thousands. Yeah, by the yeah. thousands. I think mm -hmm. I, one airline in particular laid off 10, 10 or 12,000 people the second day of the crisis. Your book, Destination Profit, Creating People Profit Opportunities in Your Organization. Could you give us a very brief take on well, yeah. what, what's this book all about? There's a, a, a model that I'll go over briefly that, that we sort of design, and it seems to encapture everything that we've been talking about during this whole conversation. And the first is there has to be a level of awareness of what the destination is. And the reason we say destination is because there's a starting point and there's an ending point. You know, we can talk about mission and vision and all of that, which this doesn't replace, but people get lost in missions and visions because it's too broad, it's too nebulous sometimes, it's, they don't know how they fit. But a destination says, here's point A, here's point B, let's get there together. So the first is creating awareness that shows people Here's where we're going, here's why we exist, and here's how you fit. Very basic, right? Would every one of your employees be able to answer that question? Why are we in business? What are we, you know, what's our bigger cause? And how do I fit in this organization? And then the second A is alignment. You hear that a lot, you know, but alignment is really around are people aligned? in terms of their values, but are your processes and your systems and all of the things that, re that will cause people to get to the destination successfully, are they aligned to get there together? Accountability is the next one. And accountability is around not just holding people accountable, but it's around creating an environment where people take personal responsibility. So it's like a contract. You know, and all of you at some point have probably dealt with contracting where with a customer or with a vendor, but what about contracting internally when the CEO and the, the senior leadership contracts with the next level, contracts with the next level to say, all of us have to do our part if we're going to be successful. And rather than pointing the fingers at each other, we each have to take personal responsibility and ownership of our piece of what makes this happen. Adaptation, because even with the best laid plans, 9-11 happens or the economy happens, things that maybe are unforeseen. And so are you prepared for the what ifs? Do you have discussions about not if, but when things happen, are we prepared? When people say, well, I don't have enough time and I, can't, I don't have the support and I don't have the whatever, I'll say, Put pretend, I pretend in front of that statement. <laughs> I mean, and it starts to really work on you. It's like, I pretend that I can't get to him. Because then you own the story, <laughs> okay? I've been thoroughly impressed by the caliber of the people here and the fact that they are so open to the ideas, the insight that they came up with, I thought was phenomenal. Uh, it's interesting to me, and I see this as I travel around, that people need permission. <laughs> They need, you know, to, to know that it's okay to be 10% bolder. <laughs> and I think they responded very well to that. If you were just 10% bolder leaving here today than you were coming in, just 10%, what would you do different? Because if you take that 10% bolder step, you'd be surprised you might get a 50% return. <laughs>